Hi, I'm Denshi, and in today's video, I'm going to show you how to download and compile your very own customized Linux kernel. So the first thing you're going to want to do is go to the kernel.org website, which is linked in the description right here, which contains obviously the Linux kernel archive. We're going to right click over here on the latest release and copy a link address. Then we're going to go to our terminal, whichever you know terminal emulator you use, and I'm going to use the wget tool to download this exact file. Now this is a tarball that contains all the source code for the latest Linux kernel build. All right, so it's now untarred. Now I'm going to run tar xvf then linux whatever it may be dot tar dot xc that's going to uncompress this tarball to this directory as you can see there is a lot of stuff in the kernel so this may take a while all right so now that we're done downloading and extracting the kernel let's take a look at how we can actually compile and customize it so if we go into the linux directory that we just created you'll see that there's a lot of things here the thing you want to pay attention to is the dot config file which if you do ls-a, as you can see, is not present at the moment because we still have to create it. A Linux kernel is customized through the .config file, which tells the compiler what to compile in and what not to compile in. This includes things like kernel modules and core kernel functions and customizing them to your needs. So there's various ways of generating that .config file. There's ways of doing it automatically. There's ways of just downloading ones that are pre-made on the internet. But today we're going to make our very own from scratch. So we're going to want to run make menu config which creates an interactable and curses menu for us to customize our kernel i'm also going to pass a dash j12 flag over here to make sure that it's using as many cores as possible when compiling you normally want to set the number to the amount of threads on your computer all right so now that we've ran make menu config we can finally customize our kernel with this interactive screen so we're going to begin in general setup and there's a lot of things you can customize about the kernel here now there's a few things at the top like compile drivers which also will not load and and things that most of these options are generally arbitrary not needed like for example, the default init path, this kind of stuff is set pretty much by a distribution. You don't need to add this, the kernel doesn't have to have control over that. However, we can change the kernel compression mode, which changes how the binary of the kernel is compressed, to boot a little faster. So uh, ZSD is generally the least compressed, so we're going to select that by pressing space or enter. And we can go down over here and disable a few other things like POSIX message queues which aren't needed. You can go over here and go to, we can also disable auditing support, go to the timer subsystem, we can change the timer to handling. So this one over here is better for battery because it actually disables the timer to completely shuts it down when the CPU doesn't need it. And this one is better for performance because it keeps the timer constantly, constantly ticking. So we're going to select that one pressing space and we can disable these two configurations as they are no longer needed. We can go down here and change a few other things about the system. Like for example, in CPU test time and sets accounting. We can disable BSD process accounting and a few other things probably here, but I'm going to keep these enables to be safe. The kernel log buffer size, CPU kernel log buffer and temporary per CPU print K log buffer size. Now I've seen a few people set these to as low as 15, 15 and 12. I'm going to go for a little preemptive uh, 16. I'm going to go for uh, 15 here, I mean, not 115, uh, 15. And I'm going to set this one to 11 is probably going to be fine. Or maybe no, I'll do 13. That's a little better. Now going on over here, there is an important option. This is the init RAM FS. Now this may be needed if you need to add modules that are kernel, like for example, Nvidia stuff. However, you obviously don't need it for every single type of compression because we're only compressing with the aforementioned ZSCD. So I'm going to disable all of these and only keep the regular in RMFS. And that's pretty much it for this section of the kernel. All right, so for processor type and features, this is where you customize things directly for the CPU. There's a lot of options here. All you wanna do is enable the Intel ones and disable the AMD ones, or do the opposite if you're on AMD, of course. We're gonna go to processor family and changes to whatever model you have. So if you're on uh, AMD stuff, you pick this over here. If you have an Intel CPU newer than Core 2 or, or a newer Xeon, then select this, which is me in my case. And if you have an Intel Atom, you select that one. All right, maximum number of CPUs. This actually can be changed as well. I don't have 64 cores. It definitely will probably never have 64 threads. So I'm going to do 12. There's a few other options over here. Like for example, enable maximum number of SMP processors and NUMA nodes. You don't need that. And multi-core schedule support. I do need this because I have quite a lot of cores. However, if you have like an only two core system or something, you could think of disabling this. Going down here, we can disable AMD microcode loading support. We want to keep the MSR and CPU ID options enabled because they might actually help with certain programs that do use that kind of stuff like for example mining software and you should keep numa memory allocation support because that also can help with some software that uses it even if all your cores share the same memory bus this might still be useful five level paging support we can disable this um now i know mental outlaw mentioned this in his kernel video and i think a few other kernel videos also mentioned this but this is basically unneeded you're probably never going to want to need this maximum numa nodes uh six would probably be okay you probably can go with lower if not no numa at all in some cases over here there's efi support i'm gonna keep this on because i use a uefi system Memory protection keys, these are for your security. However, if 
you don't want the slight tiny overhead from these, you can disable them. The KXX system call, you're probably gonna want to need this if you want to install things like NVIDIA drivers or other drivers that aren't directly in the kernel. However, if you're not gonna be doing that, you can probably disable it. All right, so that was it for CPU type and features. Let's go to power management and ACBI options. This is Pentaram. You're probably gonna want this if you're on a laptop and wanna save battery. I'm gonna disable it. And there's a few other things like hibernation, obviously. And you might wanna go to CPU frequency scaling and enable a few things here. For example, if you're on a laptop and wanna use tools to change your performance governor, then you can change it to power save or, or user space or on demand or whatever. There's all these options. I'm gonna disable this because I'm not gonna use this. However, if you are on a laptop or other devices, then know that you can change your CPU profile. And I'm going to enable the CPU idle driver for Intel processors just in case. All right, so when it comes to bus options, there's pretty much nothing to do in here, so we could ignore the default. Then in binary emulation, as you can see, not much to really customize here, so we can get out of that and just leave it as default. Firmware drivers, once again, not much here. However, if you are on a Google device, you can enable Google firmware drivers if for some reason you want that, so... Yeah, uh, whoopty do Virtualization, I'm gonna disable this. I'm not really gonna be running a lot of virtual machines, so I don't need it. However, if you do wish to run virtual machines and key moon stuff, then do enable this. General, architecture dependent options. Once again, not much here, but this generally can be kept the same, unless you know what you're doing with GCC and wanna customize a few things here or whatever. Enable loadable module support. We can basically keep this as default. Not really much that you can change here. I know Mental Outlaw, I know in Mental Outlaw's video, he does forced module loading and disables it. However, I don't really think it has a huge difference when it comes to performance. That's mostly a thing that's useful when administrating a system. The IO schedulers, once again, not much to look at here. With enable the block layer, there are a few things you can disable here, like for example, block layer debugging. Now I know Mental Outlaw mentioned this in his video and you want to disable this because, you know, once again, it's, it's bloat. It's only really needed for kernel developers, as you can see. And so it's not really useful. That goes for a lot of these log modules. They're only really useful if you're gonna be debugging the kernel, which most people don't do. So you can pretty much disable most debugging options unless you're a little bit paranoid. And with IO schedulers, once again, we can just leave this as default. Most of these options are pretty much not going to change much. Executable file formats, we can leave this as default. Memory management options, we can also leave this as default. I'm not an expert in this area, so I literally have, have little idea of what you could change here for performance. Networking support, here you could disable different things. If you want Bluetooth support, you could enable it here. However, I'm not going to be building it in, so I'm going to disable that. We will take a look at how you can disable wireless drivers later on. If you go to networking options, you can customize this very low-level internet stuff. However, I'm I'm definitely not gonna go through and do this because I'd probably mess something completely up. All right, now device drivers, this is the big one. Here you can disable and enable drivers for different devices, as the name implies, and there's a lot of things you can enable and disable, and a lot of bloat is located here because there's just a lot of devices that Linux supports. So PC card, we can disable that. Now scroll down here to NVMe support. I'm gonna enable this because I have uh, an NVMe drive. I'm gonna enable all these different options because I do use it. Now with miscellaneous devices, you wanna make sure that any of these things you don't need are disabled. I'm keeping them all disabled because I don't need any of these weird things. Now go into the SCSI device support, you can go over here and enable asynchronous SCSI scanning. I've tested it myself, and yes, the Linux kernel boots faster under that option. Now going down over here to serial ADA and parallel ADA drivers, you should basically keep this the same. However, there are a few things you might want to disable depending on your drive, but it should generally be okay just keeping this the same. And when it comes to multiple device support, this refers to things like RAID and LVM. Uh, I don't have any kind of RAID drive, so I can disable this. However, if you do, you can go through there and customize things. We can disable Macintosh device drivers as I do not use them. Go to network device support and disable things you're not going to be using. Like for example, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to completely disable wireless LAN, which I do not need. Need, alongside USB network adapters because I also don't need those and I'm gonna disable network console logging support as you might not strictly need that you might also want to enable the WireGuard secure network tunnel if you're using that kind of VPN some VPNs need this so make sure to enable it just in case if you're gonna be using a VPN all right so down to input device support uh, you can disable a few things here I'm gonna completely disable all touch screens miscellaneous devices and tablets as I do not use them you can disable things specifically in keyboards and mice however keeping these on will generally be a little bit safer all right now going down over here, you can disable all USB support if you want that for some reason, but you can go over here and enable multimedia support. You're going to need this if you're going to be playing certain sounds, and, and my sound card completely doesn't work without this, so I definitely need this in. Now going to graphics support, here you can disable a few things, like for example, maximum number of GPUs. I'm going to make this two, as I have my integrated one, and of course my graphics and my laptop, and because of that I'm going to enable the laptop hybrid graphics, which are needed. Make sure to enable the ADI Radeon or AMD GPU drivers if you are on those, but I'm not on those, and if you're on NVIDIA, and you want to use the open source drivers for whatever reason then enable this Nouveau driver. However, I'm not going to be using that so it's going to be okay for me. I'm going to be using the proprietary one. Alright, so going to sound card support, there are a few things you want to enable here. So I'm going to go to PCI Sound 
sound devices and enable your sound card because if it's not enabled here, you're not gonna get sound. In my case is one of these Intel ones, I'm just gonna enable all of them and that should be it for sound card support. When it comes to USB support, you can disable a few things here, however I'm not gonna touch this because I don't want my USBs to be completely done for. And then going down here, keep going, there's accessibility support, if you need that kind of stuff then you can enable it over here. And this section might be important, the x86 platform specific device drivers. In here you'll find options for specific devices that you might actually need for certain laptops or certain desktop computers that have like quirks or nuances about them. So if you know that your device specifically has something odd about it, then enable stuff here. I'm gonna enable the Dell stuff because I'm using a Dell laptop, as you can see all of these little laptop extras and stuff I'm going to enable, except the free fall driver because I don't have that in my system. So things like updating the BIOS for Dell devices and stuff, because it's because Dell is very friendly to Linux, because Dell is very friendly to Linux, these sort of things are included in the Linux kernel. All right, so there is also platform support for Goldfish devices, support for Chrome hardware and Mellanox hardware. You might need this, of course. I'm gonna disable the Microsoft Surface stuff because I don't need that. And going to the bottom, most of the stuff you're probably not gonna need at all. In the Android section, you might wanna build in some Android drivers just in case if you're gonna be dealing with your system and, and its file system and stuff. All right, so that's pretty much it for device drivers. That was the big part of customizing the kernel. It's probably gonna, probably gonna save us a lot of RAM. And now we're gonna go to file systems. And in here, you can pretty much keep everything generally the same, except we're gonna disable miscellaneous and network file systems. You need network file systems to use systems like Samba and other things on the network. And you need miscellaneous systems for specific file systems that some may need and most really don't, so I'm gonna go out of there. Now, when it comes to security options, there are a few things in here that you can customize. However, I'm, I wouldn't be too you know, touchy with this sort of section. I'm just gonna ignore it. Cryptographic API, once again, same with security. I wouldn't mess around in here because you're probably gonna compromise something. And library routines, the same thing here. I generally, I wouldn't touch this. Finally, in kernel hacking, you can enable things like specific logs or tracing for the kernel, but I'm not gonna enable any of that because I don't need that, I'm not a kernel developer. All right, so it's done. We've configured the Linux kernel. We can now go over to the save section, press enter, press okay, and press exit, and then we're gonna exit over here, so just like that. And now we can finally compile our kernel. So to compile it, we're gonna run a few commands. We're gonna begin by running make-j12 to compile the actual kernel. Uh, then we're gonna run sudo make modules install-j12, so it just compiles the kernel modules and installs them. Then after this, we're going to manually copy over the kernel to our boot directory so we can actually boot to it. And then we're gonna update our bootloader accordingly. But in the meantime, just let this run. It will take a while to compile. The Linux kernel is quite large. And uh, I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, so as you can see, the kernel is now done compiling, and most importantly, those modules are also installed. So it says over here that Arch x86 boot PC image is ready. So that's the actual kernel. That's the binary of the kernel. And in fact, we can go and copy this over to our boot directory and give it a new name. So if you list out your boot directory, you'll see there's a file called vmlinux and vmlinux linux. So this over here is your current kernel, probably. It might be named something else. Uh, we're gonna give it a custom name. So we're gonna copy over sudo cp uh, arch x86, but this is relative to the local directory. And we're gonna copy it over to slash boot vm linux, and we're gonna give it a name Linux uh, Alex. It's gonna be Alex Linux. And we're gonna press enter, and as you can see, it's copied over. And finally, after copying the Linux kernel image to the boot directory, we're gonna reconfigure our bootloader. So we're gonna do sudo grub mkconfig and dash o to send an output to this file over here. We're gonna press enter. And as you can see, it found the Linux image over here. Now we're gonna reboot. I'm gonna switch the kernel in the grub menu, and I'm gonna open it up here. One thing to note before we do any of this is to check our RAM usage to compare it between before and after. So if we do free dash H, you'll see our current memory usage is 1.6 gigabytes, which is probably caused by a combination of me recording and doing other things. So let's take a look at how that changes once we go in the other kernel. All right, I'm booted back with my new customized kernel. Just gonna do uname a to check. Yeah, there we go. 5.12.10, which is not the same as the one installed on my system. So if I check that one, see that this one over here is 5.12.9 and also Arch because the Arch Linux one. So let's check our resource usage. And as you can see, it's relatively low compared to the previous one, which was 1.6 or so. And this one's 989 megabytes. Now, obviously, this isn't a perfectly fair comparison. This isn't a magic benchmark that means that, yeah, your system's gonna run 1,000 times faster because you did a custom kernel. 
However, when it comes to saving memory, and especially on systems with low memory, this sort of customization can really help. And if you're in a really competitive space or something where you really need as much power as possible, then customizing your Linux kernel to remove a lot of features might be a good idea. And in my opinion, it's the one thing that really counts when it comes to custom compiling. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video I made on how to compile your very own Linux kernel. I've been Denshi. Goodbye.